All right. And, and yeah, so we're live. Good morning, everyone. And of course, uh, I want to start by thanking Ronan for taking the time to join us. Uh, Ronan is, what, what block were you in, Ronan? KB3 or KB2? Uh, I was in two of them. I think it was three and four or two. No, oh, no, zero. The first one. Oh, you were there in Genesis, yeah. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course, uh, the, the this is for the Colonel, Colonel Block 5 folks, the Gaming Guild, but we invited uh, a few other uh, participants to join us because, uh, yeah, because I think uh, we'll learn a lot from Ronan today. Ronan, for, for those who don't know, I actually feel he's part of the foundation of Web3. Ronan has worked on a lot of the stuff that we use today, like Hard Hat Deploy, um, and also uh, his work has been personally also something I learned a lot from. I've looked at Jolly Roger, his, his staff, and I've looked at the games that he's worked on. And it gave me more of an understanding of what kind of games we should be building on Web3 and, uh, and how we should be thinking about it. So, so yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion with him. And before we start, I'd like to talk a little bit about Kernel and the Gaming Guild, of course. Uh, so Kernel is... Uh, well, let's start with the Gaming Guild first. So this is the midpoint already of the Gaming Guild. We're in session four, uh, where we hope to talk about how to grow, uh, how to uh, properly deploy a Web3 application. So the first few sessions we had uh, Austin Griffith and Richard Davy to talk about making games and making smart contracts. Then we had Ryan to talk about what kind of games we should, or how we do the tokenomics for our games. And now that uh, we have that knowledge, the hope is um, we have a game and we're looking to, to deploy it, to scale it, and what should we know before we do so. Um, and yeah, and a little bit about the KB5 folks, of course, all of you know who you are, but just a reminder of how awesome everyone is. Uh, we're, uh, a lot of the KB fellows are not only technical, but also I would say artists from around the world as well. And I think that's really the strength of Kernel is having us uh, be in the uh, in collaboration and conspiring with uh, with people that are outside of our echo chambers, right? We, we like to uh, see uh, the work that we do uh, be for humans and not just for the people that uh, we're, we're always spending time with. So we're three-dimensional three -dimensional humans. Uh, we have a Bollywood actor, a tree planter, a filmmaker, farmer, and uh, and yeah, and just, uh, just normal people. Um, and I guess the goal with the Kernel Gaming Guild as well is we want to explore more than uh, more than the current games that we're making. I know the current narrative around play to earn around Web three is play to earn, and we kind of want to explore that as well. What is the future of games beyond play to earn? And I feel also Ronan has been thinking about this as well. He's worked on several projects like Conquest, uh, Eternal, Deep Star, Mandalas, and. Uh, and I guess some other examples of Web3 games that I look to uh, for inspiration are Dark Forest, uh, The Loot Project, Wolf Game, and Magic Pressure Dow. And I kind of want us to discuss or, or see what's next after that. Uh, I feel pay to earn is just the, the beginning, right? And we, not, we need to see, um, we need to be able to see past that and look at what's coming next and how we can use the technologies that we're providing. And cool, and yeah, and with that, I want to start with introducing Ronan, of course. Uh, uh, so Ronan, as I mentioned, has worked on a lot of the projects that uh, that are foundational to Web3. Uh, Hard Hat Deploy has been used for deploying the, the, the projects that are built on Hard Hat. Uh, he's worked on some uh, NPM projects as well that I also take a look at all the time. Uh, he's worked on some uh, some. Uh, very in innovative Web3 projects like Mandalas, um, Eternal, of course. And, and yeah, and maybe Ronan, one thing to ask is, uh, what's the inspiration here for your, for your profile pic? I, I see you, you use that all the time and I don't think I've asked you where that came from. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny, like I, I got it and then I never, I never left it. But basically, uh, I remember there was a, an artist who was uh, selling uh, little art that sometimes I, I like to buy even if I don't make game out of it but I like to buy like game asset pack and, and he was mm -hmm. setting up one and he had a special price so you could pay a bit more and then he will design uh, something for you uh, mm -hmm. and actually this uh, this icon is actually made out of a photo so my, my father is a photographer 
and he made a photo and actually the real guy there is my brother and but it represents uh, a special character in the folklore of my of where I come from in France uh, it's actually it represents Sorry, yeah, it represents it represents the um, uh, the servant of death actually, and mm. yeah, that. But it's it's quite a, a common like it's a popular folklore in in where I come from, and that basically represents that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, the name my my uh, nickname my like Andal is also based on the same character. Mm -hmm. We go out, right? Yeah, so exactly. It's, uh... So it's a folklore in Scotland or? No, Brittany, like in France mm. on the west, northwest. Interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and yeah, and, and maybe Ronan, do you want to do a, an intro on your end as well? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like uh, it, was, it was a nice intro. I mean, uh, yeah, been so I've been, uh, I'm a game developer as a background and I, and in 2016, I discovered Ethereum, like just by chance, really. And from that day, my dream was to make a game that I call them unstoppable game. That's how uh, Ethereum was advertising itself at the beginning, like un create unstoppable app. And when I understood what it mean, I was like, hooked. Um, and that's how kind of uh, I started. And uh, yeah, so then I realized the limitation of Ethereum, and but it didn't stop me. I started to explore what we could do with the limitation, uh, and I launched Etherplay back in 2016. Um, but then, then I realized that the technology is going, uh, is improving very, very fast. Actually, I mean, we could complain a lot as a developer that yeah, I mean, we we wish we could be already. In the future, but in the end, it's actually going quite fast. And I realized that, yeah, it's time to explore on, on maybe not on fully decentralized system, like on sidechain, we'd have uh, more, uh, kind of uh, take a trade-off, but we could explore. And that's how I started the uh, Eternal, uh, which was uh, like a, a dungeon game where you uh, every move is on chain. And so that's what for me is important in the, um, in what I explore, it's always this on-chain component because I, I think this is really where where we can be different than anything done before, and also what it enables. And I think especially for games, and that's what um, that's what may excite me the most about Conquest, and what excited me about Eternal uh, is that as soon as you have action on-chain, you can use them for many for things. And in the case of Conquest, we have a proof of play. Um, and so as soon as you have a proof of play, because I mean, currently what happened is that in the blockchain games that don't go on fully on chain, they, they have lots of issues with bots and they have to make centralized decision about how, how do we decide if it's, it was a valid move or not, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't want to, to have that. We want something to be decentralized that, that the creator don't have a say anymore. Uh, or at least it's bounded by some rule. Uh, and these rules need to be on chain, otherwise uh, we, have, we have other issues that we introduce. Uh, so we conquest, uh, we can have a proof of play and suddenly I can, we can reward by simply looking, okay, you are playing, you are rewarded. And, um, and yeah, and conquest have an interesting way to solve because on chain doesn't mean you remove bots. Um, but Conquest is actually a social game. It's a, it's a game of diplomacy and, and the game actually happen outside of the game. Um, mm. and, so, and so bots have no chance here because, uh, okay, bots will be part of Conquest, but they will be helpers uh, and not um, competitors really against uh, human alliances and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. Uh, when, when we started the, the, the gaming guild, uh, Austin shared a tweet from Alex Van Der Sant, I think, like uh, what makes a good blockchain game, right? And one, one of the things there, of course, is uh, design it for bots because uh, you're going to expect people to bot this, uh, especially now that uh, uh, everything is uh, open, right? And that uh, the people are incentivized to play as well. So they're going to find ways to make it as efficient as possible. And 
Yeah, yeah. I see a comment from Nira Jl. Like, I guess you are you are working on that right now. You know, a protocol to <laughs> basically a bot to make um, alliances and. And, and to be fair, yes, it, it could be that. But I, I think if we reach there, we we bre we manage to solve AI, general AI. And I, I don't think we are there yet. Um, but it will it's definitely an interesting challenge. Like, um, like that, that that I would love people to explore as well. Like creating bots uh, that basically talk to humans about, hey, let's attack this mm. uh, player uh, together and. And then the question is, um, actually, interesting thing is that uh, an anecdote I could put is that before I went into game development, I was in cognitive science, and my mm. PhD was that I wanted to do that I that I never ended doing, but I still want to do it someday. It actually was to do a, a Turing test. Uh, I call I call it a, a virtual Turing test. Uh, in the Turing test, you are you have. Um, just a uh, you know normal language you have to speak to to the to the bot have to speak to a human and there is no limit to what they talk about in a virtual turing test you basically create a virtual world that is so limited that the the bot have a chance uh, to <laughs> to hide himself as a human and the idea is to the idea was to increase the complexity of this virtual world uh, until it breaks down and but then you you add you keep pushing the limit of where um, where the AI can navigate, and uh, and as the game become more complex, suddenly uh, humans uh, can be discovered. But yeah, that so it's also mm -hmm. kind of uh, an extension to that in some hour. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating, right? Yeah, and and, and yeah, I, I see bots like uh, having more and more of a role in games, right? Like for example, in hyper casual games when you play. When you play them, there's always it seems like it's multiplayer, but it's actually bots that are playing with you, right? And sometimes you don't really yeah. know because it's it's limited. You don't you don't have complete information. So you so you, you think they're you're playing with them, but you're actually playing with uh, with bots. So so yeah, so that's yeah, fascinating. Been... Yeah, fascinating yeah. subject. Yeah. Yeah, I play yeah. some of these games. Sometimes it's like you re when you realize they are bots, suddenly it's time to stop playing almost because you <laughs> yeah, realize right. that they yeah. okay fine i know how to beat them or whatever like, yeah yeah and also like you feel a bit like the, the game lied to you a bit right like it yeah doesn't give you complete <laughs> information that hey i thought i was playing with you but <laughs> yeah but uh but yeah maybe we before we dive into the uh, i guess the deep discussion on uh on technical uh, ronan of course you're part of kernel and this is something we're doing uh with kernel block five is we kind of start with a bit of philosophical discussion um, and and one of the readings that were uh, in the kernel uh, in, in the learn track is about the source of freedom and open source, and I think it it's perfect that you discussed unstoppable as well. I put it up there, um, and and because that's one thing that I did also notice around uh, Web three and blockchain, right? Because there were a lot of words that uh, that we picked up when we were making Web three, like true ownership of items, uh, interoperability, play to earn, unstoppable, and something that I personally thought of also thought of a lot was uh, freeing our items from these ecosystems but uh, but going through kernel um, one of the readings says that uh, it's a critical point that the products we create should not aim to make people more free that way lies false marketing campaigns and disappointment our products should be conscious of and communicate clearly how they constrain the people who use them in doing so, they create the environment for people to become aware of the trade-offs they themselves are making, which is the only kind of freedom we can trust to generate sustainable value. So I think this, um, yeah, this resonated with me because uh, I feel like uh, in my earlier exploration of Web3, um, you're right that the marketing was about these words, like, like unstoppable. And then as, once you start building on them, you realize that it's not, there's new ones to that, right? Like for example, true ownership, like if you have items uh, that are on chain, right? and this was the, the narrative around CryptoKitties before, right? When you have these items, if CryptoKitties goes down, then you still hold your items. But, but, but yeah, but there's still no incentive for people to build games on top of the items you have, right? So it's really, there's still more new ones there. And, um, and, and yeah, is there something there, Ronan, that, I guess something that you can add to that. Is there something that speaks to you from 
from, from that point? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, definitely there is nuance to a lot of things. I mean, it, most of these things is a social contract because at the end of the day, like uh, you can make a game and that give you these items, but if the game suddenly uh, disappear, whether because people don't stop playing it, uh, then then the item lose their value unless there is someone who take over and do something with it. So at the end of the day, all I, I think I think that was a realization. It's interesting because the history of like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum show show also us, especially the the hard fork of Ethereum. Uh, was an interesting division point that make people think about what does it mean to like like to be do we block human intervention or or is it actually part of our social contract yeah. that mm -hmm. we uh, and uh, and yes yeah, so that, that is this apply also to project build on top of of such a, a network um yeah yeah so, and even DAOs are coming to that realization right like uh DAOs were supposed to be autonomous, like it's all run by a contra by a smart contracts, and now people are like realizing that maybe, uh, maybe that's not the case. Like like layer two is people, so it's uh, it, there's that social contract that uh, that should work before we kind of make the smart contracts work, right? So yeah, definitely, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I guess two two other points there, and one one thing I wanted to ask you also. Uh, so these two other terms spoke to me, like freedom is only the ability to be conscious of the constraints within which you live, and in the long run, making pro programs free is a step toward the post scarcity world. And I know some of the work you do, Ronan, is open source, and and yeah, I wonder what is the what was the reason for you to to share the 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 work that you do? What was the impetus for you to, to make sure that the work you're doing is open source? Uh, I, I think it's, I, it's something that I always uh, liked. I mean, the open, so I've been, I mean, I've been using open source things for all my life, but I mean, all, at least my adult life and even before, like Linux is one of them. So for, and, and I always liked that you could see what is, how things work. And so when I when I make a tool, for example, like like a Radar deploy, uh, for me it was ob obvious uh, that it has to be open source because I want people to help me build it, and I also have no. It also in some way remove responsibility. I mean, it's like mm. I am building that for myself, but okay, let's share it with other. It, it push me forward as well uh, because otherwise I might just have these things that work only for me and then I, I don't bother like making it more robust. Um, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I think. And so as for games, so Eternal, yeah, so usually I don't start with being open source uh, because I realize that I don't, I think it needs to reach a, a certain stage where, okay, I can open source it. But but for, for game, like on Web3, I think it's very important. Like the, for me, like it's the first, it, it need actually the code source need to be available. For, that's the first thing. It doesn't need to be open source, but it need to be available for the smart contract. Uh, this is, I think, something that everybody expects in the space. Um, but making open source is also is also important because that's uh, it's the ability to fork that make it make something decentralized. It's yeah. really this ability and. If you can't, uh, okay, you have the game, the smart contract there, okay, you can rebuild the front end, which is some, that's another interesting aspect of on-chain games is that at the end of the day, uh, the only thing you need is a smart contract. So it's true that having that is already enough. People can build uh, a front end, but in practice, uh, in practice, there is more to it because, uh, I mean, it's not easy to make a front end you need you need to get traction and and so so I think it's important yeah to to, to have that uh, open source so that people uh, can freely uh, improve it uh, and yeah and change decision yeah, yeah. yeah that's interesting yeah I guess that's also one why I kind of also ask try to have people design the smart contracts first right because uh, the smart contract will if it's there then people can start building on top of it and it's 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 a different way of making games aside from from web two. Now we design the smart contract, design the incentives, and then you kind of build on top of that, right? 
and and maybe loot project is an example of that where in the 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 game design started from the smart contracts for the nfts then the lore kind of started building up so so yeah so that can be can be a different way of building games um cool yeah and i guess we can start with that more technical discussion rodan or on uh uh, around a web architecture. So this is from one, one of the articles shared on the Kernel Gaming Guild, which is a uh, the architecture of a Web3 application. Um, and yeah, and I, I guess just from how this looks, uh, is this similar to to how you're building your games like Conquest or uh, or maybe you can describe Eternal and, and these other projects that you have and and, and yeah, and see if this is the proper uh, way to do so, or if there are any things that you would suggest uh, people take a look at before before building uh, a whole Web3 game. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it's really how it works. I think usually, so both for Eternal, so for Conquest, I the first alpha, there was not even the graph. So it was completely... Um, completely decentralized, like there was no reliance or anything. But but then I I wanted to do that because I wanted to see how far I can go. And then I realized, okay, now I, I need, I explore that aspect, but I think it's important to give a, a nice user experience. So I think my philosophy here is like, you can, you, it's fine to have backend that help uh, the front end. So it could be like a WebSocket server that help you have like a very quick update on things that happen. Maybe a, a, a social layer where you can see interaction with that are not on chain, but that allow you to see that there is people actually playing right now. Um, all of this um, for me is fine, but you always need to think about how can uh, can someone run this on instance and, and so be free of, of the, the central a provider uh, that is currently uh, being used. So it means like you need to be, so for example, one of the things that I want to put, so I already started to put some open source uh, part for Conquest. And one of the first things that I will put out is actually all this backend that I have, uh, that I want people to run by themselves if they need to. Um, so basically what it means is that if you have a backend, you need to be, uh, you need maybe a fed, fed, federated one would be even better. I mean, currently, but this is also more work. But at least one where someone can run his own and then ask other people to join them in their instance. Or if it's a federated network, then they could talk to each other as well. Um, and so you could have uh, like, like this kind of independence of, uh, of the project. Yeah, uh, that, that's interesting, Ronan. Federated, uh, yeah, can you describe that a bit more, what that means? Uh, so does that mean that other people can run their own servers? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I will take an example because like in Conquest, I have this, uh, uh, I have actually, I didn't implement it yet, but I have this plan to have a, an inbox uh, because currently Conquest, it's, Conquest is a social game. You have to, to, to talk to the other player. Currently, you just put, uh, your your Discord name, your telegr Telegram uh, like logi uh, nickname, etc., so that people know how to reach you. But ideally, what I want is that people can post message to each other, and these messages need to be you need to be able to send them while they are offline. And I think there is a lot of there is probably work being done out there to do it in a proper decentralized way. Um, I don't think they are production ready yet, so I I think. For me, it will be to implement some of them. But the idea is that if I implement one of them, I, it could be, OK, it's one server. People send their message, and then other people read their message if they have any. Um, and a federated one will be that you could run multiple instances, and they talk to each other so that you, you it's kind of, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. kind of an email. An email is a federated network, mm, for example. Yeah. yeah. like. Uh... Like I know there was a like a social uh, I guess a social library like Mattermost right that that was a was that a federated server wherein anyone well the goal is someone can set up their servers and then these servers will communicate with each other right um, yeah yeah, yeah there is also that's... Mastodon uh, for Twitter like a Twitter clone that mm, Mastodon yeah yeah. yeah. 
Ooh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so so I guess one thing to take away there is uh, you, you started without the graph just to push it to see how decentralized things can be. And and what the, I guess just for everyone also, what, what were the benefits of using the graph? Uh, what did it allow you to do for Conquest ETH? So yeah, so so graph is basically a caching layer, uh, and, and yeah. So you, in the previous version without the graph, uh, I had to. So in Ethereum, you have to make an ism to retrieve data. Really, one is to make a call to the contract, which is relatively efficient. Like you can call, uh, okay, what the owner of an NFT, and you call that function, and it gives you the owner. Um, but sometimes you, the state of the contract is usually actually not uh, completely inside the, the contract. So, so something you can't access. For example, let's say I want the list of all NFT. I mean, actually, that particular case is, can be implemented, but then it becomes slow because you have to, mm -hmm. to go over a list. Uh, and for Conquest, for example, is a planet. There is an infinite number of planets. And if I had to... Um, uh, to give a list of all planets, I will increase the gas cost of the system because every time you uh, you get hold of a planet, I have it. I have to add it to a list, um, which the only purpose is for you to get to know the list. And so usually, what you do, you you trade, or you make a trade off, because what is the most expensive in in uh, in blockchain is storage of data. So get rid of that list because uh, what you can do instead is you emit an event that tell, okay, now I have another planet. And then you have a, a system like the graph that will uh, listen to this event and reconstruct the list for you. And then you can query the list, but, but because the graph is also uh, like a gra graph QL engine, allow you to kind of make more smarter qu query as well uh, in an efficient way. So, so the graph is two things, it's like a caching layer, but also a way to make query that you you might you don't even need know you needed it in the first place um and it does yeah. i mean and, and another parameter of course is that the graph is open source and so you can run it on your on your own so uh yeah yeah and i guess a question from mirage is do, do you run your own graph though to serve the data from your subgraph or you use the graphs uh, subgraphs yeah so for me it was an important thing uh, to see so that was always the, the, the issue I had with the graph is that I, I'm not a DevOps person and, and I didn't have much time to explore it. And I always like, oh, it doesn't work. Okay, I, I want to have this running uh, before I commit to it. Uh, I want to see how, and so now I, I have it. So I have a, a, a digital ocean in, instance that runs the graph, uh, which on, on my uh, conquest, I'm, I'm probably going to set it up for uh, for the beta, the upcoming beta. Um, but I will I will use it as a fallback more than anything. Um, but yeah, for me it was important to be to be able to see. Okay, and and also I have now the recipe for my player to tell them. You know what? You can also run the graph yourself, and so that's that's also an important aspect. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Uh... Yeah, and I guess we can go to a little bit of uh, of the stack, uh, Ronan. I know, for example, uh, with Jolly Roger, you have a uh, um, like the, the front end there that you use is uh, is Svelte, right? Svelte and Tailwind, is that correct? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And and yeah, maybe uh, some advice there or, or what was the why did you decide to go with Svelte and Tailwind for the, the front end for Conquest or for Jolly Roger, rather? Yeah, so actually for Conquest, yeah, and Jolly, uh, use Jolly Roger, I, I usually merge mm -hmm. back in. So it's kind of a fork of Jolly Roger. And yeah, so for me, Svelte, uh, so I've never, I'm, I'm not a front end dev, but like I would, I mean, it's not my past. My past is more like a game dev, but I've always been interested in web technology. I, I like to do web games. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, that's always a passion for me, trying to do something that you just need a web browser. You don't depend on App Store or anything like that. You just, it just runs there. So that's the first thing that tell me, 
and, and for Web3, it was an obvious uh, decision anyway. Um, and, and then about the framework, so I've, I've looked at few, I, I have some experience with React Native, I had, had some work, I done some work there, but I always feel it was a bit complicated, um, mm. not very HTML uh, style. And Svelte introduced a compiler, which is in some way something I don't take, uh, I take precaution before jumping into this kind of stack. But the nice result of Svelte is that you are dealing with HTML. Like, um, and it's, it has a nice feeling. You are building an HTML component. It's just HTML on JavaScript. Um, or I use TypeScript in my case. But um, yeah, so the, I think it's a, it's simpler uh, to read. And I think simpler to probably have someone who knows HTML and CSS to come to your project. Um, yeah, that's kind of, and Tailwind, uh, I mean, CSS, I always struggled with it. Uh, and I feel Tailwind make my life easy myself. I don't know if it's a good decision for someone who, who knows CSS, uh, but for me, it was like an easy way to, to put stuff uh, yeah. More quickly, quicker, yeah. quicker. I, and also they the have nice way. choice. Yeah. 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 yeah but, so you don't have to think of the classes, right? Uh, Tailwind already defined that for you, so you can just pick and choose from that. And it's very uh, opinionated, right? On on how to do uh, grids, for example. So you don't have to think of that. Um, ooh, yeah. And I guess also one thing to talk about, Ronan, is your choice of chain. I know that the Conquest Eat has been running on XDI, right? And Gnosis or Gnosis chain. Um, and, and yeah, uh, I guess uh, knowing what you know now, or, or maybe uh, you, you can talk us a little bit about uh, which chains you went on first. And uh, and yeah, and knowing what you know now, what, what which chain would you uh, make a game on uh, if someone was going to make a, a new Web3 game? Yeah, I mean, I it's a complicated uh, decision. Like, it, it's, it's hard to know you, uh, whether this is the right choice at any point, maybe, but uh, maybe I can describe yeah, what I went through and how I, I see. So for, for me, yeah, I, so my, for Conquest, the funny thing, it was the first idea came like in 2019 and it started to implement in 2020. Uh, and at that time, even the gas, the gas cost was quite high uh, in Ethereum still, but still I want, one thing I realized that, yeah, maybe it could run on, on Ethereum mainnet uh, with, of course, not everybody could play, but there was this kind of thing. Yeah, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a game and it runs fully on chain. Why, why not? Um, but obviously the gas price keep rising at the same time. And I realized that also the adoption of sidechain started to grow. Uh, and I realized, okay, maybe maybe I should go, but then I should maybe explore this side chain. And I, I did explore them with Eternal actually, with uh, Polygon and uh, and Exile both. Actually, Exile was my first choice uh, for Eternal. So the first prototype was uh, made for Exile. Uh, there was a benefit here for Exile is uh, the dollar, uh, the peg to dollar thing, which make. I mean, to be fair, the, it changed a bit the rationale. The, but they, they try to keep it, uh, the gas price fixed, uh, which they can't do it, but they, they try at least to, to keep it low. Um, and, and also for the player, you have like this, yeah, this uh, dollar value, which might be more uh, easy for some uh, to, yeah. So that was kind of, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the good thing about XDAI, but then uh, I think, yeah, we went for Eternal at the end, we went to Polygon. Uh, the, I mean, there was few reasons for it. I think we got more, uh, we, we were more welcome, I think, to, to Polygon than XDAI. So we kind of explore that route. Uh, they gave us a grant as well. So I think that's something that is good also about looking at chain is that usually they are looking for people uh, yeah. to build on them. Uh, but for Conquest, my initial goal was to run on L2 uh, because I realized I am one of the, it's one of the only games that can actually run there. Um, and again, like it kind of it go back to 2019 where maybe it was kind of the relative price. But then I realized also, wait a minute, realistically, 
who is going to pay like maybe like I don't know 200 no, or probably it's even more like maybe it's like 400 dollars per month to play the game of course I mean if the planet are like one thousand dollars each and some ten thousand dollars but but then you are like uh you are basically filtering filtering a lot of people and so basically yeah. might not so I, I I I made a kind of I made a reality check myself and I realized no I, it, it can't be done today on L2. And so I looked at, around and I realized that even Polygon was is now a bit more expensive than it used to be. And, and Gnosis Chain, I had experience with it. Um, yeah, the dark forest running there. Um, and so I thought, yeah, it's the end. The, the cost is very cheap. So I think it's a, it's a good choice. Uh, and I also like the, the roadmap. Uh, they, they have a, a commitment to be uh, the Canary network for at 2.0. They, they already have a Bitcoin chain there. Um, and so this, there is two things for it. that I think it's cool that they do that, but also it, it might allow them to scale, um, to, even if there was a lot of adoption, uh, adoption to their chain, like Polygon have, for example, if they manage to get sharding before everybody, then they get an edge as well on that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's also another question you have to ask yourself is, can it run on multiple chain? Uh, and that mm -hmm. was how the con so conquest so actually is changing now uh, because I've been thinking about some token economics for conquest and, but let, I'll just keep, I still, yeah. So I, what, what I, let me go back. So for conquest, the initial idea was uh, like you just take, uh, put some token, DAI token on the mainnet, on Ethereum mainnet, and then you have a token that, that you can transfer to a Gnosis chain, for example, and start playing there. But actually this work on every uh, chain. So you, Conquest can be run on any chain. But with, I'm saying, so maybe your game could be that, that kind of game where actually uh, you could have an instance there, an instance there, and it doesn't affect uh, the token economics. Uh, and, and I'm mentioning my the new thinking for the token economics because I think for conquest this won't be possible down the line, depending of what choice I make. But it depends yeah, of what game you are making. Yeah, I, I guess that me, does that mean Ronan that you have to build it on solidity if you want it to be playable across chains? Uh, yeah. So does that yeah, mean it's, yes, yeah. That, yeah, that's true. I mean. Uh, it, that's uh, so it depends. I mean, you could always port your game to another platform, but it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, I, I, I would like to port uh, to explore uh, Starknet to port uh, Conquest to Cairo, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think the difficulty is actually in porting the, the contract because at the end of the day, my the contract is like I don't know how many line of code, but you. you it's feasible. The problem is that mm. the, it's not only that. Like you need, if you use the, gra the graph, you need to have the graph support. If you, if you use maybe a library for MetaMask, and suddenly there is another thing. So you, there is a lot of things mm -hmm. that you also need to think about. Uh, um, yeah. 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 Like if you go, I, I know I was looking at Starknet for example, and you'd have to use I think the Argent X wallet, right, versus MetaMask. So you need to add support for that as well. Uh, yeah, and, and I know uh, Ronan, you don't you like uh, we, we don't want to take up much of your time. So I guess uh, just a, a last question before we go Q and A um, is about yeah, and and good that you mentioned Cairo as well. So like, uh, what do you think people should take a look at in the future? Uh, something I've also been seeing people discuss is Cairo and Starknet, and maybe that's uh, and it's because of zk rollups, right? Like you can do more complex computations on Cairo and hopefully have less gas costs. Uh, so aside from that, or is that something we should take a look at? Or maybe the, are there other advancements that people should be taking a look at when they're building something for the future? I mean, Cairo, I think is an interesting one to move uh, now because there is a, a community also. So, you, I mean, you get the benefit of being one of the first uh, if you mm -hmm. get there right now. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think one question I have personally about Starknet is, is that 
uh, nobody who works there that I talk to uh, who work on using Carlo have a clue about what the gas cost will be. Um, okay. So there mm. is a lot of like promises and it will be, uh, I believe it, ZK can definitely be cheaper, but uh, realistically, what does it mean? Like, for example, for my game, like Conquest, how does it compare to the Gnosis chain? Uh, and my estimation right now is that it won't be at that level yet. Um, mm. So it depends what kind of game. But also, Kero is, you can also use Kero without StarkNet. So you can use Kero as a, as a proof, like a ZK proof engine that you can use in your contract on another chain. Like you could even have, like, using Kero for your game that run on Gnosis chain, for example. Um, I, I don't know in practice how, how, how much you have work to do on top of what is available. But uh, yeah, there is some article, uh, one, uh, one dev by his name of Kilari have wrote a, a blog post on uh, how to build uh, such a game. Like you have the verifier on Ethereum and you use Kero, not for StarkNet, but just for uh, a proving system. And it's a battle game where you have, you can have very complex mechanics. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's kind of... Yeah, I, I think I actually just saw that earlier today also. Uh... But yeah, uh, I guess we can move to some questions and answers, Ronan, for the next few minutes. Uh, and we can start with Craig's question. So what are your gas costs on Gnosis chain for, for basic transactions? Uh, I forgot the number, but it's, it's like really, really cheap. I mean, for Conquest, at the end of the day, it adds up, you know, like it can be very, very cheap. And then you play a game and it, it starts to, to add up. I don't have the number in mind, but obviously you can't do, you have to be careful of what you do. So Conquest was designed for uh, for gas cost because, I mean, I I did a lot of uh, trade-off now that I can, uh, it's cheaper. So I, the game is a bit more complex and it's actually, yeah, there is quite a lot more gas now than it used to be, uh, but the, the game, it's more about the game design in Conquest, it's a game that play over time. Like you make, you send spaceship, they will take, they can take one day or like, or seven hours to reach. So you, you are not dealing with like, oh, I move, I move every second or I move every, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, Eternal was another game where the, it was more in intensive at what you do on, on chain. But so you have to think about that if you want to do an on chain game, like, and I think it's so maybe the decision of chain is actually second secondary to the game design. You have mm. to think about how how first your game design is optimized. But to to try to answer your question is like uh, it's I think it's less than it's less than one thousandth of a cent to send a spaceship in conquest. So you you could send one thousand before you reach yeah. one dollar something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, and yeah, next uh, and maybe Kirill, if you want to hop on and ask your question as well. Yeah, everyone. I was curious about the human to human element of these games, and wondering if that would lend itself to the tabletop style, you know, like D and D or Shadowrun, where you have a game master and you have a largely social interaction that would be supported, where the avatar was on chain and the events that happened to them were on chain. Yeah, I mean. Yes, it's interesting. I, 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 I'm a, a RPG player myself, like a pen and paper myself. And uh, I always thought it would be cool to do this kind of thing where you have like a little web tree style kind of thing. And so I, I don't know, I don't understand much of what you mean where on chain. So you mean like the actions they do, like for example, the roll of dice will happen on chain and then the, but the game master will still decide what to do or like something like that yeah yeah yes yeah, i think the, yeah i mean it could also be like the game master need to roll a dice where he can decide maybe to give some sort of direction maybe because i guess the on-chain part i think it's important that some way the smart contract have a have a role because otherwise like why do it on chain even mm -hmm. though i i mean to not give too much game master thing but yeah. 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 But I yeah, something to add to that. Like Niraj and I have, have been talking about open gaming and using uh, loot as the 
I guess as the, uh, one of the inspirations for building a game, right? Like loot, of course, was inspired by DND and DND items. And mm -hmm. what kind of game can we build on chain uh, using that? So I think a lot of people are thinking about that also, Kirill. So, uh, mm -hmm. so po possible. I think the challenge there is, as Ronan said also, right? That you smart contracts need to make sense uh, because, uh, like, you can if if it's all a social component, right? Then you could actually build that on, or, or just play that using, for example, some of the games on Steam. Like, uh, I know there's a tabletop simulator game on Steam, right? So what can smart contracts do on top of that uh, game that will make it have sense mm -hmm. and have value? Uh, it's interesting, like in, in Eternal, uh, so we, so I was, so I was not alone with Eternal. So my, the original idea was a very simple game. And then I, um, and then as a team, we kind of think about different avenue and we, the game became a bit like uh, you had two types of player. You had the, the player that go in the dungeon as an adventurer, but you could also own room. And then mm. the, the player who were owning the room had uh, a decision upon what happened in that room. And they, so they became kind of dungeon master. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... That's maybe one way of doing it. Like you could have a game where uh, maybe the role of dungeon master is more fluid. It's about uh, context, and then they have a different choice they can make. Interesting. Beautiful. Uh, I Thank think you. As you were talking about that, Ron, and I'm reminded of Dungeon Keeper, where some you you yeah. make the the room, and then there's like the heroes that attack, and now there's like two, I guess two points of view, two two kinds of player types. That's very interesting. And, and yeah, and Mark, uh, I see you have your hand raised. Do, do you want to ask a question as well? Yeah, so um, I spoke briefly with you about it the other day about, uh, I'm sure most people are aware about the situation with uh, like Steam and the general consensus that most launchers and platforms don't want anything to do with NFT based games. And, you know, it's pretty uh, like a blanket ban going on. And so we're, we're currently running a beta and our beta is a direct download from our, um, from our website. Now, initially we had planned to go to Steam and run a launcher, auto updates, you know, typical game. And now that's not possible because of the regulatory issues that Steam is trying to avoid by supporting games like ours. And I find that probably most platforms like GOG and others will follow suit with what Steam is doing. So my concern is, is that, you know, how do we solve the version control issue without having the user have to download a zip file every single time that, you know, we, we push a major patch, right? I mean, Unity Config does some version control, but, um, you know, we, we haven't really gotten to the point now where we necessarily needed to have advanced version control, but even in the beta state, some users are complaining about having to you know, download that zip file every time and, and store their own version, basically. So I was wondering what anybody had any thoughts about how they're going to operate version control um, without the, the use of the traditional gaming platforms like Steam or the App Store. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, I guess, Ronan, is there something you, you can talk to? Yeah, about? I mean, to be fair, I'm not too familiar with the process, but I, I could imagine. so. I, I can see two issues, like one, uh, so I'm, I just want to understand what the issue, but I, I can see one is, so the, the fact that players need to download and the, the fact that you want players to have a choice, because if, um, if you don't care about the choice, if you want to give, you just force the update, could you not implement that yourself in the game that it's auto update? Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess so one we, thing to add we, that. Yeah. we could build Sorry. an in-game launcher for sure, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know that's that's definitely. But you know, our Unity team has, you know, pushed back a little bit on me because I mean, it's just it, it's pretty much widely accepted now that most launchers come from a third-party software in like gaming, uh, like traditional games, not may, maybe blockchain games, but you know, everything is handled by Steam and and third-party applications. So. Um, you know, my team has pushed against me on the version control setup and, and moving 
to a system like IPFS and then and then going to a, uh, a built-in launcher that does an auto update. Yeah, it would require a little bit of infrastructure, but it's not not a crazy idea developmentally. And but you know they they have you know pushed me to consider you know going to one of these platforms as it's considered industry standard. And uh, my fear is is that it doesn't look like the the landscape is changing at all. Um, you know, uh, Steam has been pretty firm in their opinion that they don't want to support Web three games. And I like I said, I feel like other launchers are going to as well. And, you know, we personally haven't really had a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of experience, you know, with Steam in the long run, but as, you know, as we're developing more and more patches, it does seem to be a problem for users to have to download that zip file and handle their version control separately. So, uh, you know, my question is, is really just, you know, how is everybody else handling their version control without the, the, the need for the app store? Are they just doing the zip files and I've just got some cranky users? Um, or uh, are, are, is everybody building, you know, in, in-game launchers that have auto-update features? Yeah, so for me to answer that question, personally, I, uh, my game are on the web. So they are basically, this is taken care of by the web browser, but, um, yeah, it would be. I can see the problem, and I, I think it would be cool to to have like um, maybe um, all all uh, all company having the same issue, getting together to build a, a, a trusted launcher that um, basically do what everybody needs. That would be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. like a, as a uh, some type of a. Uh a decentralized protocol that would provide for a launcher or something, or even, even a platform, you know, honestly, when we started looking at engine, it, it really sounded like that was what engine's ultimate goal was, was to be the launch pad for web three games. But I think they've kind of deviated from that a bit. And there isn't really anything in the space that I've seen, even in production that, that would be like a platform for web three release. So you know, maybe that's something we could talk about later on um, you know, as a community or something. Yeah, yeah, and I guess to, to Ronan's point also, I think uh, 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 there's a reason why a lot of the, the Web3 games are natively web also, Mark, right? Like uh, you, you, did mention, you did mention the challenge with Steam and these app stores. Um, and I think um, we can also lean on the strengths of the web. Um, so, uh, so you can distribute regardless of app store. Uh, I, I know, for example, Ronan for Conquest ETH, right? Uh, uh, there's... Uh, it, it tracks when there's a new version, and it's a uh, and it's a browser that keeps track of when something should be updated, right? But some things are stored uh, offline on the browser. Um, yeah, is, is, is that yeah, how yeah. it works? Yeah, I mean, it actually it auto updates. There is a notification to tell you there is a new version. This is how. So yeah, now a modern browser has this ability to to have atomic update. Uh, like safe atomic update. Um, and so it will switch the version uh, when all of this is downloaded and it will mm-hmm. tell the user there is a new version and they just need to reload because that's how like the browser can be sure that there is no issue where there is some old code being executed with the new code being uh, added. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's what, yeah, actually Jolly Roger have that already built in. So if you use Jolly Roger, you are, that, that's a, I spend a lot, of, a lot, a lot of time making sure that uh, the web experience is uh, the best I could get from like the basic. So Jolly Roger includes all of that. Like you have a, an IPFS ready uh, website that, that have all these features. You just need to change like the, the icon, uh, the preview, and then build your, your app. But it includes that, that thing that tell you, oh, there is an update pre- uh, and you click to reload. Yeah, yeah, and that is the link to Jolly Roger, right? Uh, yeah. Roger. Yep. All right. Thank you, uh, Ronan and Paul, for your guys' input on that. I appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I guess just one thing to point out there is, uh, is yeah, like um, I, I do tell people that uh, there are some trade-offs with using Unity. I know Unity is like. Like I would say, almost nine, more than ninety percent of game developers use that right now. So, um, but the challenge is, it's not really optimized for what we're building. And if you want to look at something, then then Jolly Roger, of course, is uh, an example. It's building on um, on the modern web, and like when you're using Unity, it's like you're 
you're forcing certain things to be done, right? Like the wallet connections, for example. It's not very elegant, I would say. Um, but cool, yeah. Um, uh, I guess we're up to the R, Ronan. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for the time. Thank you for spending it with us. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure everyone learned a lot from, from the discussions today. Um, and yeah, is there anything you wanted to mention uh, before we end, Ronan? Anything you wanted to share or to discuss? Uh, you know, I think we did a, yeah, we did, did a good overview, but I'm, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm available if you have any question, like always interested to know what you are building as well. Like, and so if I can help or whatever, happy, uh, just DM me. I don't, I, Kernel is still using Slack, right? So uh, yeah, are you still there cool. on the channels? I, I yeah, but the, I, yeah. I see. I know because the, the thing is that I never check Slack, so and I see it's yeah. getting even more. So, uh, yeah, maybe the best is uh, Telegram or or Discord. Uh, yeah, I, I put yeah. my. Can, can you share it on the chat, Ronan? Yeah. Okay. So but if you do see. find the time, uh, the, the Kernel Gaming Guild channel is uh, is still there. Like people can still discuss if, if you have any questions there, or if you want to reach out to any one of us. Um, yeah, I will check. I mean, uh, I just need to yeah to get back to this a bit. I usually have the tab open for Slack, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's there's so many channels to join, right? Uh, yeah, but cool. Yeah, thank you, Ronan. So I'll just stop the recording now.